Mina, Ohayo gozaimasu. Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Once again, Ohayo gozaimasu means good morning. The reason you didn't see a 30 minute sermon on Sunday is because, well, I'm getting ready to go to bed and it's Monday morning, so this has kind of been my Sunday. <laughs> Again, my sleep schedule is really out of whack and really, really weird. Didn't forget to do my Sunday stuff. Still going to do my Monday stuff when I wake up this evening. But before I go to bed, before my day ends, I want to give you guys some stuff. I want to give you stuff that I normally give you on Sunday. And so I, did, I thought about, like, okay, what should I do? Um, what should, what's going to be a good message for this Sunday? How can I follow up the hell sermon? You know, should I maybe make some kind of happy thing, some love-themed thing? What I ended up deciding to do is to go with what I've been reading in the Bible recently. It's not it's actually not incredibly positive or overly loving. Some parts of it are. It's very good. But this particular message is going to be a message not so much with definitive answers, so much as it has questions in it. I want to present some truths and some open questions to you guys. This is going to be one of those... This is what it says in the Bible. Here's what I think. Tell me what you think. This is going to be a message for you to reflect upon, a time for you to develop your own thoughts, your own ideas. By all means, leave all such comments um, in the comments section below. Love to hear your thoughts on what I have to say. And um, if you have a differing opinion from mine, I'd love to hear that as well. Some of these things, I'm, also, I'm not sure if I'm even going to have a, a definitive opinion on. I might have one. I might not. Some of this stuff is just kind of like, Hmm, I wonder. It just kind of makes me think. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a lot of the things that occurred in David's life. I've told you guys that 1 Samuel, and I'm going into 2 Samuel now, 2 Samuel as well. Oh my gosh, forget Game of Thrones. We well, don't have to forget it if you like it. Um, but this action, this stuff, all the drama... All of the backstabbing, all of the behind-the-scenes politics, the warring for a throne, all that stuff has happened in real life. All that stuff has been historically recorded and written down. Intrigue, betrayal, blah, 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 so much stuff. And I was like, you know what? That's way more than enough to cover <laughs> one 30-minute message. So I'm going to just throw some of these things your way, and they are a bit controversial. They put question marks over my head. I have an opinion on a few of them. I can't say, like, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, here's the truth, here's what the Bible says. Well, I can tell you here's what the Bible says, but I, can't, I don't derive an objective truth from this particular story. Some things in the Bible, like love your neighbors yourself, those are commandments, and what it means is pretty friggin' clear. You love other people. When Jesus says, love your enemies, that's pretty friggin' clear. You see someone you don't like because they're a doofus? You love them anyway. You treat them with respect and dignity anyway because that's what Jesus commanded us to do. And, you know, moral obligations, um, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, all of those things, they're very crystal clear. They're very obvious. When the Bible gives us historical stories... We are meant to learn from that. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians, I want to say chapter 10, that the Bible, the Old Testament specifically, was written to give us examples of what to do and what not to do. And David, my gosh, you know, he was guaranteed an eternal lineage by God for his faithfulness. And that eternal lineage was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came down. And of course, his kingdom will last forever. And he is a descendant of David. So, bam, prophecy fulfilled right there. And David's life is incredibly interesting. And some of the things in his story, it's like you know, some, of the th some of his obediences are very clear. What he did is solidly written down for us to know, like, here's the event, here's his reaction to the event. But what we gather from that, your mileage may vary. You may pick up different things from different parts of the story. So I wanted to cover parts of those today. I'm I haven't even finished 2 Samuel, so I'm definitely not going to get to all of them, but I wanted to cover some of them and give just everyone here a little bit of brain food. So without further ado, we're going to kick this off in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm the old school. I don't have a bunch of tabs lined up. I love to flip through my Bibles. I love to, I love to hear the pages flip. I love to actually read it out of a written text. That's what you get for being old. You do old-fashioned things. <laughs> 1 Samuel 
chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. I did make notes of where I wanted to go. I did at least do that much. So 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Now David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? So David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has ordered me on some business, and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you, or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Then David answered the priest and said to him, Truly, women have been kept from us about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. So the priest gave him holy bread. For there was no bread there but the show bread which had been taken from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. So we have the old bread, that it was holy, it was, on the, it was the show bread on the table of the Lord, and this hot bread was cooked, put in its place, and the old bread was taken away. But apparently it hadn't been discarded yet, so David was like, hey, can we eat this bread? And the priest was like, well, if you guys are pure. That was forbidden. You didn't do that. Okay, technically you didn't eat the, sh the um, and no one but the priests were allowed to eat the showbread of the Lord. And I'm pretty sure that applied to regardless of when it was cooked. Well, actually, there's supposed to always be bread on the table. I should have probably brushed up on my study of the showbread before bringing up this example. I apologize for that. Go men nasai. I'm still a wee and a taku, even in the middle of my Christian messages. Very important. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not... He, David said the bread is in effect common. I don't think so. I think the show bread was holy. As soon as it was consecrated to the Lord, once it was cooked and placed on the table, it was holy, period. I forget if the priests were allowed to eat of it, or if it was supposed to be disposed, or either one was an option. But I'm pretty positive David should not have done that. Yes, it was old bread. And yes, the young men had kept themselves from women. And the bread, you know, had been taken down. But it's still kind of like, David, you're, you're kind of pushing it here. It's not really allowed. You know, I wouldn't say it's like a death penalty type deal or anything, but certainly it wasn't in accordance with the protocol lined up in the law of Moses. Now, I would say, you know, well, this is kind of a, David, should you have done that? I kind of I kind of question that. And Jesus answered this one for us. It is definitively not wrong because God himself had an opinion on it. So let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who are with him? Quick side note, the Pharisees were right on this. You're not supposed to gather food on the Sabbath day. So, technically speaking, they were in the wrong. They should not have done that. And I forget, there were various... There was one man who actually did some work on the Sabbath, and he was stoned to death in Moses' law. I might have actually covered that in one of my previous messages on here. So again, I don't, I forget like maybe it was just any kind of Sabbath breaking whatsoever. But according to my knowledge, you're not supposed to gather food. I know they weren't, they weren't allowed to gather manna on the Sabbath. They gathered enough on the, sa um, on the day before the Sabbath, Friday. They gathered a double portion. So then they wouldn't gather any manna on the Sabbath day itself. And, they would, and, it, and the food would not rot, but it would last for an entire 48 hours where normally the manna didn't last that long. That way no work was done on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees were right. I mean, it was written in the law of Moses. And Jesus, God, had a slightly different perspective. And, you, and some of you will say, well, he's the one who wrote the laws to begin with. Um, isn't there kind of a problem there? Well, let's see what he had to say. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? 
how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, I'm going a little over um, verse 4, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? In other words, you're, you're not supposed to work while well, the priests still did their priestly duties on the Sabbath day. Um, you know, they took sacrifices, they read from the law, they did their job on the Sabbath day. That wasn't actually covered anywhere in the law, whether they should or shouldn't. That particular part was not mentioned. But Jesus is basically saying, you know, technically speaking, they're doing their job on the Sabbath. But they're considered blameless. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So Jesus knew he was Lord. He knew he was God. And he's saying, essentially, while those laws are in place, I prefer mercy over sacrifice. And these things don't bug me. Now, it would be so easy to go loosey-goosey on so many things if you're like, well, you know, God said that in the Old Testament, but, eh, look, he's a merciful God. My res and my response to that line of reasoning is, let's not take this instance where Jesus was like, don't worry about these particular laws. Let's also not forget that Jesus laid aside the entire sacrificial system and the entire priesthood with his death on the cross. Let us not forget that he said that it is what goes into a man's stomach that makes him unclean, but what comes out of a man's heart that makes him unclean. In effect, redoing the entire Sabbath rules, or not the Sabbath rules, but doing the, undoing the entire unclean versus clean law of the Old Testament. And he even went so far in the book of Acts, he gave Peter a vision where he told him to rise up and kill and eat unclean animals and do not do not say that this is unclean when the Lord has cleansed it. So when Jesus gave these particular exceptions to the Sabbath, he also cleared up a few other things from the Old Testament and said, by the way, things are shifting around, things are changing a little bit here. So don't use this one verse as a license to say, well, God was like, you know, let's wait, you know, basically don't have sex until you're married in the Old Testament. He's not too worried about that. Uh, Jesus also, a few chapters before this, said if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. And if the woman's not married, I'm pretty sure that would count as fornication. So certain things were taken away from the Old Testament, but some newer laws were added, which are actually a lot stricter than the Old Testament. Not, you know, not having sex outside of marriage or committing adultery, that's one thing. Not even lusting after a woman in your heart, completely a different story. Completely a different level of obedience. It's an obedience of the heart. So don't run wild and free with that particular verse. But yeah, so Jesus himself said that what David did was technically wrong. God wasn't overly fussed about it. And of course, we read in the Old Testament where David went on to become king. He wasn't put to death when he did, when he, or even punished in some smaller way, when he ate the showbread. He went about his business, God continued to protect his life, and God eventually handed the kingdom over to him. So, and God greatly blessed him. So this, you know, this was technically against the rules, but God was like, I'm not fussed about it. I'm not worried about it. So going back to 1 Samuel chapter 21, Jesus himself cleared up that little debate. It was technically wrong. Probably shouldn't have done that. God allowed him to do it anyway. And then moving down to chapter 21, verse 10. Again, some of this you're going to be like, I'm not entirely comfortable with that explanation. I'm not entirely comfortable with, well, even what I just read in Scripture. Well, in that, that's why I want to read it, because I want you guys to think about this. I want, I want this to be a message where, you have to engage. I'm not just telling you here's what to believe. Again, I'm gonna, I voice my opinion. I told you what I think. But I can't assuage all your doubts and fears. I can't wipe them all away. You need to think about these things. You might need to wrestle with them in your heart a little bit. 
And we're going to cover a few more topics. So I'm not just bringing up one thing. I'm going to bring up a few things. We're going to keep on moving along here. So in chapter 21, verse 10, Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And we're skipping around the chronology a little bit. Don't be too fussed about what order things went in. In 1 Samuel, it's pretty much written chronologically, so if you want context of when these things happened, back to what I said earlier, read the book of 1 Samuel. It's so good and juicy. So back to verse 11. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Well, he wasn't king at the time. Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Based on that one little course alone, the neighboring nations misunderstood his position. Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And I will add on to that um, verses 1 and 2 from, chap from the same chapter, chapter 21. And I'm gonna re I will reread them. It sounded kind of weird, reread. Anyway, <laughs> now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? So David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has ordered me on some business, lies, and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. Lies. Total lies. Should Now David was trying to protect Ahimelech by not letting him know what was going on. David was primarily protecting himself. Um, Ahimelech was unfortunately later on killed when Saul discovered that he had assisted David in even a small way when Ahimelech didn't know and actually thought that David was being obedient to the king. David was protecting himself and I think he was also trying to protect Ahimelech and so he straight up lied there. And now in the presence of the king of Gath, David was purely protecting himself. He pretended insanity so he could get out of there and wouldn't possibly be imprisoned or killed by the king. So under those two circumstances, he lied. He straight up lied. Would God have made everything okay had he not lied? Well, Ahimelech died even though David tried to cover it up. Well, if David had just been straight up honest, would Ahimelech and his family have lived? Would God have saved them if he'd been honest? No way to know. What happened happened and what's done is done. The Bible doesn't give us what ifs. The Bible gives us the history. God could have given us the what ifs. He chose not to. And when David was before the king of Gath, should he have just been who he said he was? Or should he have commenced with his little thing of deceit and lied to that king? And thereby, in a very natural way, through cleverness, preserved his life. Was that right or wrong? Personally, when it comes to extreme situations like that, um... I would tend to not fault David for that. The Ten Commandments, when it talks about thou shalt not bear false witness, that's referring more specifically to perjury more than lying. And I'm not saying lying is okay. As a Christian, I'm all about the truth. I want the truth. God is a God of truth, and he does not lie. And I want to be like my Father in heaven who is perfect. Lying is subpar. Lying is not the ideal. Lying is not what I want. At the same time, under situations like this, I will reference all the way back to Rahab, who lied to the people of the city that um, Joshua and his sp and the men, or actually it wasn't Joshua, it was just the spies of the... No, Joshua was one of the spies, I'm sorry. Um, or was he? Shame on me, I don't know. Either way, Rahab protected the spies that were there by lying to the city officials. And her life and the, her family's life was saved when Israel came in and destroyed Jericho. And Rahab also went on to become a part of the lineage of Jesus as well. So, was David wrong to do what he did? Was Rahab wrong to do what she did? I would tend to say no. They were not wrong. They did lie under the circumstances they needed to to save their lives. Um, and Rahab, the lives of her family. Um, in order to align with Israel and in order to align with God's people. I would also, under these circumstances, say, you know what? Technically, David was wrong. He lied. Just like he was technically wrong to eat the holy bread. But, just like with the holy bread and Jesus gave him a pass. Now, Jesus didn't mention this particular verse. And I'm not going to assume that what Jesus would say here. 
I am saying I don't believe David was at fault or at in sin under those circumstances. I think what he did was okay and acceptable. But technically, well, no, he really and actually did lie. And technically, lying is a bad thing. Perjury is definitely a bad thing. But lying in general is also a bad thing. It's not something you want to practice or do on a regular basis. Was this a possible exception to that rule? I would say yes. Something to think about. Let's move on to 1 Samuel 23, 17. And he, Jonathan, said to him, David, do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Well, he got half of that right. He died um, when he was fighting the Philistines with his father Saul. Even my father Saul knows that. So Jonathan is staying with his father, Saul, who's clearly fighting against the Lord's new anointed, David. David doesn't hold it against Jonathan. Jonathan doesn't hold it against David. And even though he knows that David's going to be king, and because they're such good friends, he knows that he's going to reign beside David, although that he was wrong. He, that didn't happen. He died. David didn't hold it against him for fighting under his father Saul. And Saul didn't kill Jonathan, even though if you go back to, if you go back, da 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 da, da I didn't look this up in advance, so I'm going to try to take just a second to find it. If you go back to 1 Samuel 20, that didn't take long, verse 30, Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Saul didn't kill his son, despite him knowing that he sided with David. That And that whole little story there was... Uh, Jonathan trying to find out what Saul's intention for David was, for good or for ill. And obviously it was for ill. Jonathan didn't think so. Well, he was wrong. It was for ill. He still fought alongside his dad, despite knowing that David would be the king. Was Jonathan... Well, obviously Saul was in the wrong for opposing David the way he did. Even if David hadn't been prophesied to be the king, David did nothing wrong deserving of death. So not only was he anointed king... He was also guiltless. He didn't commit treason against the king. He, Saul was completely and totally in the wrong. David was simply fighting for his life. He was trying to live and thus fulfill the prophecy of the Lord that he would indeed be the next king. And I, have, I find no fault in David whatsoever. Was Jonathan right to keep fighting under his dad? Despite knowing what, um, what the Lord was going to do with his father and with David, that Saul would not be established as king forever, that David would be established as king at some point in the future, should Jonathan have went over and fought with David? Well, we know that he died fighting under his father Saul. Jonathan perished. I'm inclined to say Jonathan should have fought under David. Then Jonathan would be fighting against his own dad. And obviously... Let, let's just be honest, guys and girls. Do, you, do we really want to fight our parents? Like, some of you are like, yeah, I'd like to kick their butts, actually. <laughs> would you want to kill your parents? If your answer to that is yes, I would seriously suggest seeking professional help. You need to seek a little bit. You need to seek prayer. And if the pastor advises you to get some counseling, I'd get the, that counseling. You should not have a desire to kill your parents. The natural desire, the natural inkling of a human being is to love their parents regardless of what they've done. I'll call out um, my dad on his bullcrap, and I called out my mom on her bullcrap whenever he commits it, whenever she committed it. Um, if you may know from previous videos that my mom has passed on, and my dad still lives. And if you didn't know, you know now. I don't put up with crap, um, and I would certainly not support them if they did anything against the Lord or against the Bible. But... I certainly don't want to hurt them, much less kill them. And the vast majority of human beings don't want to hurt their parents, much less kill them. It's like you don't support them through the, through the junk they're doing, but it's not like you actively oppose them, try to tear them down, try to hurt them or deprive them. You just don't do that to your folks. We, I would dare say, you know, the vast majority of humans don't need the Bible 
to give us that bare, that bare bones minimum of don't kill your parents. The Bible goes as far as to say is to honor your father and mother. And, you know, maybe Jonathan was doing that. Maybe he should have sided with David and he would have lived and not died. And that on that gray note, I'm actually going to end the message. Um, at least the, the sermon part. I'm still going to give an invitation to become a Christian and to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But yeah, just that last one is a good gray area, a good thing to get your um, thought processes and thought juices going. What should Jonathan have done? Was he right to do what he did? Was that properly honoring his father? Or was he in the wrong because he eventually died with his father Saul when it was clear that David would be king one day? And Jonathan himself knew that and still fought beside Saul, I'm guessing simply because Saul was his father. And he wasn't going to betray his father. Even though he also wasn't going to betray David, he was in a very horrible middle position where what he could do was kind of limited. What do you guys think? I like sermons where you have to think a little bit, where you're not just spoon-fed and told what to believe. I like, I like to keep an open mind. I like to keep a broader perspective. But there is one thing I will tell you for sure, that without Jesus Christ, you will all certainly perish. We're all born into sin. We've all done things that are wrong. We all need God in our hearts and lives. We all need his forgiveness. And the good news is Jesus died on the cross to give us just that. We died, Like I said earlier, we don't have all the sacrifices of the Old Testament because Jesus came and he changed on that. He offered his own body and his own blood on the cross. And he died there so that all of our sins could be washed away and we could be made completely clean before God and become his sons and daughters. Won't you accept God's invitation right now to become his son or his daughter, to receive forgiveness through the blood of his son, Jesus? That's not a gray area. There I'll tell you exactly what the Bible says. And the Bible is very crystal clear that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.9 You don't have to wait on that. You don't have to question that. Of course, you're free to do either one. You have that freedom. I'm strongly encouraging you not to do that, to accept the Lord into your heart and to make Jesus your Lord and Savior today. And if you want to do that, just tell him basically what I just said, that you know you're a sinner and you know you need what he did for you on the cross. And if you want like a model prayer to pray, let me, let me offer you that to, um, right now. Pray after me if you wish. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit, God, that I need your help. And I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me and you shed your blood so that all my sins could be forgiven. I also believe that you rose again three days later. And that you, as you have life everlasting, you promised that same life to me if I'll believe in you. So right now I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. Let me be your son or your daughter. And thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for hearing this prayer. I love you, and I praise you, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you just prayed that prayer, you are now a son or a daughter of the Most High God, and that is awesome! Welcome to the Christian household. Welcome to the family. It is good to have you on board. If I may encourage you, find a Bible of your own. I'd say preferably one that's not quite as beat up as this, at least not initially. You should definitely, that would be go with my next encouragement to read, it, read on it daily, stay in it daily, get your Bible to the point where it is a bit beat up like this, where you need to buy a new one like I do, and just invest a little bit of time. It doesn't even have to be an entire chapter, but invest a little bit of time every day reading God's Word. Invest a little bit of time praying to God every day. Just a simple, God, I need help on this, or God... Please help me to love that person that's my enemy, because I really don't like him. Something that simple is a prayer, and God loves stuff like that, he, and he loves to answer prayers like that. Start praying to him, you'll start seeing him move in your life and in the lives of the others that you pray for. Prayer is real, and it works. I promise you that based on my own personal experience in my own life and the lives of others around me that I've seen changed forever due to godly prayer. Also, find a group of people that believe the same thing as you, that Jesus is Lord, that, he, that they need him in their life, that believe that the Bible is the word of God, usually you'll find those people in a church. Try to find a church 
somewhere close to you that believes in these things, that can encourage you in that faith, and people who believe the same thing as you. Because it's really super helpful to find like-minded people to encourage you to stay strong in the Lord, to stay strong in His Word, and to just maintain a closer walk with Him. And to encourage you, just in your day-to-day -day life, to live for Him every single day. So thank you guys very much for watching this video. I love you. God bless.